welcome to the Indie Writer Podcast, where we talk about all things writing and indie publishing. Today, we are excited to talk about Memoir Backlash with Megan Colhango Great, who has been on before, as well as Yasmin Azad and Esther Amini, who we are thrilled to welcome on for the first time. Yasmin Azad, who was born and raised in Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka, was among the first group of girls in her Muslim community to go away from home to pursue a university degree. In her 20s, after a brief stint as a lecturer, she married and moved to the United States. Living mostly in the Boston area, she raised her children and worked for over two decades as a mental health counselor. Her memoir, Stay Daughter, draws on her experiences growing up in a warm and close-knit but conservative society, which at first resisted the education and independence of women, but had eventually to embrace modernity. It is also informed by an understanding derived from her work as a counselor in the West, that the breakdown of traditional family values and structures comes with its own challenges, especially for women. She is currently working on a novel which explores the issues of family and belonging. Stay Daughter, a memoir of Muslim girlhood, was chosen by Kirkus Review as one of the best indie books of 2020. Esther Amini is a writer, painter, and psychoanalytic psychotherapist in private practice. Her debut memoir is entitled Concealed, memoir of a Jewish Iranian daughter caught between the Chador and America. And you might have to correct my pronunciation with that, Esther. The word is chad, Chador, which is chador. the Persian way of saying burqa. So caught awesome. between the Chador and America. Chador and America. Kirkus Reviews anointed Concealed, one of the best books of 2020. Katie Couric and Zibby Owen selected Concealed as one of their 11 favorite books and showcased the memoir on November 30th, 2021 at the Stryker Center in Manhattan. Esther Amini's short stories have appeared in Elle, Lilith, Tablet, The Jewish Week, Barnard Magazine, TTA University's Inscape Literary, Proximity, Paper Brigade, and Medium.com. Um, Esther Amini was named one of Aspen Ward's Best Emerging Memoirists and awarded its Emerging Writer Fellowship in 2016. Seven of her pieces have been performed by Jewish Women's Theater, aka The Braid, in Los Angeles and in Manhattan, and she was chosen by Jewish Women's Theater as their artist in residence in 2019. Kai Flix, Jewish Netflix, is presently streaming an excerpt from Concealed called Amrika. Esther Amini lives in New York City with her husband. Megan Colhane Galbraith is a writer and visual artist. Her work was a notable mention in Best American Essays 2017, has been nominated for two Pushcart Prizes, and has been published in Tupelo Quarterly, Red Diver, Catapult, Hobart, Longreads, and Hotel America, among others. She is Associate Director of the Bennington Writing Seminars and the Founding Director of the Governor's Institutes of Vermont Young Writers Institute. Her debut hybrid memoir and essays, The Guild of the Infant Savior, an Adopted Child's Memory Book, was published by Mag Creek Books and Ohio State University Press in May 2021. This is just wonderful company. I have been so excited for this episode. Well, Megan, I wanted to start with you because our last conversation, which was about the post-publication letdown, like how we feel after our books come out, um, after all the hype, we started talking about some of the negative responses that you received to your memoir from people who were mentioned in it. So I'm wondering if you could just tell us maybe like a summary of what that backlash or what that was, what happened? Sure, sure. And, you know, honestly, it was some people who weren't mentioned at all in it, the backlash. For it, for my purposes, you know, being adopted and, um, and finally, you know, writing a book where I had a voice kind of goes against a lot of what adoptees are supposed, supposed to, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, supposed to do and supposed to be. And, and that's what I'm so interested in hearing your stories, Esther and Yasmin, because you have culturally have things that you've overcome. And, you know, so publishing this memoir, I don't know what my family, my adoptive family or my birth mother thought it might be, but everybody sort of, I guess, has their own projection of what you might be writing and what their story is. So when it came out, or before it came out even, I had to, because I used uh, visual pieces in the story to tell my story, uh, I had to go through a process during publication where I asked for permissions for from my birth mother, let's say, to use three photos, one of which was a photo of our reunion. And then I, I uh, asked a sister to see if I could use a photo of the three of us, you know, that my dad had taken. And it resulted in this really terrible backlash where they both sent me very strongly worded lawyerly terms, you know, that, you know, you are, you will not, I will not give you permission to use, to use these photos unless I can read, revise and edit your full manuscript. 
that. Whoa. You know, and, and both both had both my birth mother and my sisters uh, had a gaslit me a lot in the past and accused me of lying and having false memories. And thanks to the publication of the book, it wasn't until I met um, a number of people in the adoption community and really connected with them to realize I'm not alone in that scenario, that this is a typical thing that sadly happens to adoptees, you know, who are supposed to be grateful. You know, there's the savior, there's the savior complex in adoption. So we're supposed to be grateful and how, look how good you have it. And they kind of saved you, your parents saved you. And I think that's where my sisters were. And that's where my dad was. And my, uh, I think my birth mother, for many reasons, I don't know why, but they, none of them, she does not talk to me anymore. Uh, my dad does speak with me, but we had, a uh, we had a difficult conversation where he said he felt betrayed by what I wrote and that hurt deeply. Uh, and my two sisters, you know, can suck it. Like, <laughs> I think one of the great benefits of writing this and using my voice was realizing the people in my life who actually will support me and are proud of me. And that happens to not be my sisters, uh, my adoptive sisters. And if I really think back on it, that's been the case all along, sadly. So there was a freedom in that, in using my voice and, and hearing what falls away and seeing who falls away as a result. Esther, Yasmin, I was wondering your experience. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I'm deeply moved and, and sad to hear what your experience was. But at the same time, I'm not really surprised. When I wrote my memoir, which was a very difficult process, and I was working on it for five years and rewriting it and rewriting it, I, I had to write about my parents, my brothers. I had to write about neighbors, teachers, and the city of Mashhad. The city of Mashhad is an Iranian city, uh, which is fanatically Islamic with zero tolerance for anyone who's different. And my parents came from that city and they pretended that they were Muslim when they were really Jewish. So they were crypto Jews. So to write about the city of Mashhad, and this was in the middle of the 20th century and how they treated anyone who was different. There was this fear as I was writing for years that there would be backlash. I couldn't quite pinpoint it. I really was terrified of Iran and feeling like somehow if this book comes out, there'll be delegates from the city of, of Mashhad. There'll be imams and nalaz who are gonna to try to track me down for basically saying the truth. But back to the point, I'm, I made a very clear decision that I was not gonna share my manuscript with anyone. And I wasn't gonna tell anyone about the details. Certainly they knew I was writing a memoir. Uh, when it came to family and friends, I just left it very loose. And I said, you know, I'm writing a memoir um, and it's taking me years. I'm doing a lot of research as well. People wanted to read it. And I would say, not now, because it's gonna change. And it will. It changed so many times. But what I really didn't want to hear was input, because I knew if I said, and this goes back to you, Megan, if I said, oh, um, do I have permission to tell this story about when this happened to you? And very likely they would say, no, you don't have permission. And then what do I do? Defy them. But if I don't ask permission, I'm not defying and so I made a very conscious decision that I wasn't going to ask permission and I was going to just write it and let the chips fall wherever they do. And it was the best route to take because those that I thought would be upset were not upset. And if anyone was uncomfortable or felt I had trespassed, they kept it to themselves so I didn't hear anything. I think the bottom line is that if you're going to write a memoir, which is self-disclosure, and it's being, you're being super honest, you're digging deep, you're revealing the most intimate parts of yourself, you cannot be thinking about other people. You just cannot, because it's going to crimp you, 
And uh, it's like censorship. You're, you're inviting censorship. Uh, and as a writer, that's, you feel muzzled and handcuffed. There's no way that you can write freely that way. I think it's a rule of thumb as a writer to feel uh, that I am free to write the way I want to write, to I think the way I think. My intentions are good, but if there are stories that make people uncomfortable, so be it. Uh, I know why I'm doing it. I know my intentions. And I really don't want to hear from the outside world. I want to write it, put it out. And then, yes, I'm curious to hear how people respond. But I don't want to be shaped or formed throughout the creative process. Mm. What are your thoughts, Yasmin? Thank you. So my memoir, um, the subtitle is uh, a memoir of Muslim girlhood. So my beginning to want to write a memoir had not so much to do with me personally, like what, what was my experience, but what had happened to the Muslim community in the years since I was a child and now when I'm, you know, very much older than that. And perhaps Esther can remember that in the 1970s, if you had gone to, say, Afghanistan, Kabul or Tehran, you would see girls in miniskirts. Right, yes. Esther? Yes. You would, you know, and that was true for Sri Lanka, too. We are a small Muslim community there. And I wouldn't say we ever wore miniskirts, but we didn't cover ourselves, not even a headscarf, not even my grandmother and mother. They had given up headscarves. And I went back like in the early 1990s and things had changed. Not only were most Muslim women in headscarves, they were wearing the burqa, you know, this thing from head to toe. And I, my question was, why did this happen? Why are women willingly doing this in the Muslim world when most of us, you know, were so happy to take, you know, not to get up? And, and, and that made me think about, you know, Islam, Muslims, women, and it also relates somewhat to my experience here in the United States as a mental health counselor. So most of my work in the United States was done with people, women, who had very challenging um, diagnosis, which is a borderline personality disorder. And the, the gold standard for treatment for that was uh, devised by a therapist called Marsha Linehan. And what she says is that this is partly a, a, a diagnosis that is the consequence of a lack of enough connection, that people have become isolated and that it affects women more even than men because we are the connective, we are the connection seeking gender, you know, we want it. So it made me look back to my community where connection is so strong and Esther might agree with this, nobody does connection like Muslims. It's because it's said in the religion that you have to maintain kinship ties, that you will not be forgiven if you go to, you know, if you die without making up with your brothers and sisters, whatever. So that, you know, like when you come away from a community or a society, when you look back and see things that you never saw when you were embedded in it. So I looked back and I saw all this connection, all this community feeling and my question was, is this regression, does this regression among the women, which I call regression when they wear, you know, something that covers them in black from head to toe, has this something to do with feeling threatened by modernity? You know, and I, I understand perfectly well that, you know, Saudi Arabia and its export of fundamentalist Islam, Wahhabism has a lot to do with all this. But my feeling is that kind of ideology doesn't take root unless there is some receptivity in the people to whom it's being exported. You know, people, you know, like tomorrow, if somebody comes and says, we all have to be, I don't know what, um, like we were 20, you know, 200 years ago, we're not going to do that unless there's something is, that is responding. So, so my memoir tries to explore why, why did this happen? Why, why is this trajectory going, you know, as I said, why are people turning inwards? This, there are long debates that are happening in the Muslim world. If you look in the internet, like should we have birthday parties? Birthday parties are something that comes from Western culture. And Muslims have said, you shouldn't celebrate your birthdays. That's not part of our culture. So this, the, my memoir takes place in that framework of something happening to the community that I was born in. And so the backlash part of it is, first, my own fear. I, I, I'm a cultural Muslim. My, I forged a spiritual life that now has moved away completely. But I care for the people that I was born with. And two things 
that the backlash concern, you know, I'm concerned about one is there's a lot of Islamophobia. So is my writing going to make it worse for people? And I care for all people, should I? But then I ask myself, if not now, when do I write it? And like you said in my introduction, I was one of the few women of my generation who went to the university. So who is going to write it when other women didn't have the opportunity to go and get their learning? So I feel like it's incumbent on me to write it because I, I fortunately, I was given the opportunity to read and write and practice my skills. And I have got some backlash in terms of you haven't interpreted the religion right. You know, that's not exactly what it means. That's not exactly how it is. And I said, it's a memoir. It's not a sociological treatise. This is how I interpret it. This is how it affected me. And this is how it is. So that's the backlash. But in personal terms, I haven't because I think what I try to do, and I hope I've done it, is to show both sides of the issue. You know, it's not like all modernity and westernization is just this perfect place and all Muslim communities and women are oppressed and repressed. That's not true. It's much more complex than that. So um, I, I, it, my father portrays, you know, is, is a big part of the memoir. Unfortunately, he, you know, did something that caused somebody to lose a you lose their life. And uh, I try to put that, I try to present that with compassion. You know, my spiritual practice focuses a lot on compassion for people. And I try to present it like that. But in the wider Muslim uh, political things, yes, um, many people would have said, not many people, but some people have said, you just didn't present the religion right. That's I don't so... know what right would be. Thank you in all for sharing. Yeah, go ahead, Megan. Oh, no, I was, uh, to Yasmin, to, in a similar way in, in terms of you just didn't present it right. I think that's what the narrative from my family was the same way. You know, I had my birth mother saying to me, oh, you can write about, you, you can write your story, but don't write about me before you were born. That has nothing to do with you. And I was like, you're my mother. <laughs> what? All of this has to do with me. So it was this this weird pressure of, you know, there, there's then this identity Thing that comes in also it's like how do I own my own story when it's told through her narrative you know so my book became sort of this explore this meta narrative on the explore exploring like memory as a coping mechanism so you mm -hmm. know people yeah. who've been through great trauma you know how do they remember things and you of course remember things that allow you to survive you know so your memory is and so here I am and here you all are as sort of the truth tellers and to maybe people who don't want to think about what your truth is or what their impact on your truth may have been. And so it's very, I wonder if they have, does adoption exist in Muslim communities? You know, coincidentally, my, the second book, the book I'm writing now has, it's about adoption. Is it? It is because, is it okay if I go there, Becca, or mm -hmm. do you want yeah, to? Yes, of course. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Muslim community does not recognize an adopted child as a real child. Yeah, yeah. And growing up, I had, I saw many adopted children treated. In my work as a therapist, I sort of had two kinds of suffering. One is like incidents happen to you, you know, it's a divorce or, you know, you've lost your job or something. And the other is what I call exit existential suffering, which is where you feel you don't have a right to be on this earth. Yes. Whatever, whatever, you know. And I felt like the adopted child children I knew had that feeling of existential yes. pain. Do I yes. who am I? To whom do I belong? Where is yes. my place on earth? And I'm and I feel very passionate. And I hope I can stay in touch with you, Megan. I just want to know, you know, because I'm not adopted you. myself, but I want to I mean I the the, the people that I, in my memory, I cannot talk to any longer and they might not. But what was it like to be in that situation? Yeah, I would Who I would love I? to because you're explaining it exactly that this this existential dread. And I, I call it I call it a diaspora. You know, uh, I have found adoption to be a great connector to many things. But the sad part is no matter if you're adopted, uh, domestic adoptee or an international adoptee or transracial adoptee, we all have, we all carry this existential dread <clears throat> and it makes me, it makes me so sad. There's, I think I was on Twitter just a few days ago, we were talking about this and it, there's this sense of a collective feeling like we can be so hyper-connected because we're great connectors and great people pleasers. 
and yet feel so alone? Like how, what is that paradox? My closest friend in the United States happens to have three adopted children. And I was in a car with her one day when they were talking about some other people. And they said, well, how many children do they have? And this person said, well, one adopted and two biological. No, one her own and two biological. And my friend said, they're all her own. One's adopted and one's biological, two are biological. And that, you know, it was like a, like a dagger into her heart when she says they're all yes. her own they're all my own children and you know i'm, I'm beginning to get emotional here but oh. I, I can't well i think this is a great segue esther and yasmin with your background in mental health work and megan with the content of your writing i would love to hear all of your thoughts on writing in general and memoir writing specifically as um kind of a means of healing I, I think, you know, women, women get, get a lot of sort of flack for like, right, you know, writing as confessional writing from, to, from a place of healing, but my book and writing my book, first of all, there were two things for me, like writing my book, which meant writing in my voice, which meant having to get over a lot of these weird ticks that I had, which was, were things like writing in the third person, writing in the second person. And I started to question why do I have such a hard time writing in the direct voice rather than the passive voice, which made me realize because I wasn't allowed to use my voice, you know, or I didn't know how to use my voice. So just though that connection, and then when I started writing, um, identifying feelings, uh, I think it's a big part of, uh, for me as an adoptee, to identify having feelings because largely when I was growing up, I felt numb. And, you know, I remember a teacher of mine saying, you know, Megan, like numbness is a feeling. And that blew my head off. I was like, oh, it is. And so I began to question, why did I feel numb? What do I actually feel? You know, as an adult now trying to bring her voice into the world, you know, after a late, like a divorce at 50, trying to date things like what, what foods do I actually like? What feelings do I actually have? Do I like movies? Do I not like all these weird things are, are ways of healing. And, and, you know, I was, I was like through my book, I was allowed to, I allowed myself, I think, to explore all these things and to write it thinking no one else would ever read it. And that was the terror when the book was accepted for publication (laughs) There was this sort of staged process where, okay, this is accepted. Like, oh my God, this stuff that I didn't think anybody would ever read is now maybe going to be read. And not just that, but now I'm going to have to speak about it. So I, it, that in itself was an incredible growth and stretched me beyond a lot of my comfort zone. And that in itself, like the difference between having a voice and using your voice to me was a great healing for me because again, I'll go back to like using my voice Esther to your point, like nobody can silence me. You know, I have a right to my story. I have a right to tell my story. I have a right to my feelings and writing them down. And again, it was very interesting to me as an adoptee to, to see that the book and and my writing and and I was embraced by, by the larger community, by writing writers, I admire by the adoptee community um, and the, the people closest to me in adoption, the four people closest to me in adoption, my family were the ones who had the hardest time, who gave me the most pushback. So again, to me, that's, that's like, okay, ha. Wow. Gives me insight into how I grew up, what I was allowed to do and not do and say and not say and feel and not feel. And it also gave me insight into who is willing to grow with me or who's willing to receive my voice and hear it and be proud of me for that. And uh, so it's been a long, I think, healing year for me, thanks to this book, which I hope I never have to write another book like this. (laughs) But, but... Uh, I'm, I can't wait to start on my next one, which is adoption related, but it's not necessarily this much, this, uh, emotional. I can relate to a lot of what you're saying, Megan. When you ask the question, Becca, as to what the writing process was like and was it healing, there are so many different threads, so many different answers. 
Number one, I think to write my story, which is an underground story. Uh, my parents were underground. My ancestors were, they were Jews who were pretending they were Muslim for generations. And they were uh, very fearful of being murdered for being other than who they pretended to be. And they came to the United States, and I was born in New York a few years after they immigrated, and all of this was right after World War II. So I grew up, the title of my memoir is Concealed. They lived a concealed life, but I grew up li living a concealed life, and I had to hide who I was because the expectation from my father was that I not be educated. Uh, the girls in the city of Mashhad were kept illiterate, not allowed to walk into a classroom. My mother was illiterate, my grandmother, all the females before me, and they were also expected to marry at a very young age. My grandmother married at the age of nine to my grandfather, who was 20 years older. He was 29. Um, imagine a nine-year-old girl next to a 29-year-old man, and that's her husband. And that was the norm in the city of Mashhad. Um, so here we are in New York, and my father has the expectation that I do not learn to read and write, that I remain as illiterate as possible, and that he marries me off not at the age of nine, but certainly by 14, 15, and having to hide my dreams, my aspirations. I, I loved school. I was reading under the covers in bed with a flashlight. I felt like a villain. I felt like if he found me, you know, I had sinned big time. And traveling through the years, concealing uh, who I am and, and coming across very sweet and deferential and accommodating. So here I am now, many, many decades later, writing the story, starting with early childhood, bringing it way up to today, where I have grown children who are married and have children of their own, and I have a more than one profession. I'm a writer, I'm a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. And so from this mountaintop, I look back and write the entire story. And it is about revealing. It's about revealing all that was concealed. And it is exhilarating. It was terrifying, but also exhilarating. And I felt it knitted me together. I felt an integrative experience. I felt that memories were surfacing that I didn't have access to. Being a therapist, I had to be in therapy myself. And so I was certainly in therapy. And I thought I knew my story. And when I was writing other islands of memory, surfaced to the top and I would start writing about them and they were attached to other memories that started to show their face and then I would write about them and so I was uncovering more than I knew I had access to which was very exciting for me it was wonderful and I also felt I was giving voice to my mother who was a, a very strong character but was never allowed to be educated and could certainly not write her story. Uh, and so I was giving voice to all the women who came before me, which I felt was really important. It was an act of defiance, I think in a very positive way. It wasn't out to hurt, it was out to tell. And uh, there, is, there is something in my case that it just felt, it definitely felt reparative, but it went beyond repair it almost felt, it, it felt successful. It was a real feeling of completion. Like I would say after the book came out, I would say to my husband, if I die tomorrow, I'm good. I'm in good shape because this was what had to finally be birthed and it's out there and it will never die. It is, it's been recorded. It, it is a way of feeling, I've not only immortalized myself, but I've immortalized my legacy, my heritage, my story, which no one knew about. I mean, the story of the Jews of Mashhad is kept very quiet. And it, uh, for various reasons, the Mashhadi Jews keep to themselves still. 
and do not write their personal, private, transparent story. So it, it really felt like I conquered my own fears. Uh, I conquered the inner critic and inner censor that was constantly telling me, I dare not do this. Uh, they're going to find me hanging from a tree one day. Uh, and to conquer that voice left me feeling very strong at the end. It was really wonderful. So I'm thinking of something that Esther said, and I feel like next to raising my children, writing the book is what gives me like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so for me personally, I think writing, I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, I would say I'm, I'm both diffident and shy uh, innately, but it had, me had um, you know, writing has made, has pushed me to be different because in some ways you can't do anything until you're willing to take that step, right? And as they must know, that's what you do in therapy too. You you just have to say, you know, I have to do this. So that's what it has been. But what writing did is it gave me sort of like a longer view of once again of the community and women. And I realized that the one thing that communities like mine, which are very conservative and traditional, the one weapon they hold over women is if you step out of line, no one will marry you. That's you and you know that's you yes. know and you if you re, yes. I don't know if you know people most people know Pride and Prejudice right so when the younger daughter elopes it's the whole family that's going to be disgraced nobody will come near yes. you yes yes and I remember when I was very young this whole phrase of people will talk as the worst thing that can happen to a girl people will talk what will people say and I was you know being I was, I said, I was, I was a pretty diffident child, submissive. And I said, oh, I must never let people talk about me. Never, ever. <laughs> and my journey as, as I pushed to go to the university is finding out it doesn't really matter if they talk. It doesn't matter. I can do my thing. And so that, you know, that whole, you know, the whole thing about uh, therapy or anything is know thyself, right? That's the rule. That's the fundamental rule. You get to know yourself. So I got to know that part of me, the part of me that was terrified that people will talk. And then eventually the emergence, I can't say I'm completely out of it. I think we never, you know, th that idea, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do what I want to do. So that's the gift in a way that the book has given me. It's, it's, it resonates so strongly with me. Yasmin, because in the Persian culture, the word is abru. Abru is your reputation. Mm -hmm. It isn't just your reputation. Everything you do has an impact on your parents, your siblings, your cousins, right. your aunts, your uncles, the deceased ancestors, and the future generations that are going to come out of you. Mm. Yes. And so you have to watch everything you do and you should not step out of line and stepping out of line, there, there's a whole there's a whole definition as to what a woman is, and right. a woman is not outspoken. Uh, a woman remains quiet. A, a woman defers to her husband. A woman does not have a career. Her career is to birth children, and there's a whole definition. And so when you step out of that mold. You are disgracing not just yourself, but generations that are going to come out of you in the future. So how do you feel about that? You know, it's terrible. It's a terrible weight to be carrying. And so, yes, it's, it's very, very familiar to me. And right. it's, it's something that I can see the virtues of being cautious and careful and realizing when you say something or do something, it certainly has impact on others. And to take that into account but the degree to which it is expressed and handled is suffocating. Yeah. It is suffocating. Yeah. And so you do have to defy a brew. In Catholicism, which I was, I was born in a Catholic charity hospital in Hell's Kitchen. And in Catholicism, we simply call this shame. <laughs> and and one, of, one of the things I learned writing my book was not only was I born of a shameful act, but that I on it was the embodiment of that shame. And these things came cascading in like, oh, no wonder I had an eating disorder. You know, I know adoptees are four times more likely to commit suicide, but no wonder I was had suicidal ideation. Like, no wonder I had, 
you know, I was sexually acting out like all these, all the, until, you know, you don't know. And, um, identifying all that stuff. I remember, I don't know where I was sitting, but I just remember having that revelation. Like, Oh, I, I was the shame. Like I am the shame, you know? And then to over have to kind of overcome that because like, screw that. No. <laughs> right. And nothing like brings dishonor to a family as a women, a woman or a girl showing that they have normal sexual feelings. Wow. That, that, Absolutely. that is so bad. One of yeah. my cousins just a little got into trouble because somebody thought they saw her waving at a boy. Just that just that you could do how oh, what a shameful thing to do yeah. so you know i i completely hear you when you say that shame about sexual feelings is worse than say if you have a shame because somebody robbed a bank or something that you can get over you know down yeah. the line yeah. but not this and, yeah because men really, do that men rob <laughs> it's so interesting to hear like all of these different perspectives and then i'm thinking about but but the same the same experience of being a woman who has had to repress her voice and her sexuality and her realness because I grew up in a small conservative town in rural West Virginia and my novel is very sexual and so being just overcoming the fear of that of what will everybody in my little town think of this straight A student who <laughs> wrote a book about sex I relate to that but in terms of my memoir, it's not a um, it's not just a straight memoir. It's an academic slash ethnographic slash memoir look at the punk rock scene in West Virginia during the 90s and 2000s. And I found it healing because when I was participating in it as a woman, I never felt like I was fully a part of it because, you know, punks are men. <laughs> And through writing the book, I've kind of realized, oh, oh, I'm a fish. I'm a part of it. I'm the documentarian. Like I've kind of claimed my part in that scene after participating in it. So that's been my experience. So I want to kind of shift gears to talk about something that's a little raw for me right now, because somebody that I write about a lot in my memoir that's to come with WVU Press he was a big part of the punk scene and also a very complicated part of the punk scene. And he passed away on Tuesday. And so my fears writing this whole draft have been, what is his, what is his reaction going to be? And now there's kind of this, at the same time, there's this freedom of, well, he can't react, <laughs> but also then that's with, <laughs> with the other idea of, but aren't we supposed to respect the dead? We shouldn't speak badly of, <laughs> of the dead, but people are complicated. And so I'm wondering about your perspectives of, about um, like, what do we owe the dead in our writing? I've, I've struggled with this just in, in, because I think people martyr, get martyred, you know, that you die and you, you can be martyred. You know, my adoptive mother died very young. She, you know, she died at 55. And I, I just wonder what my narrative would be like if had I been able to ask her the questions that I was hadn't even formed yet, you know, and in within the family, there's a sense of like a martyrdom to her and a martyrdom of my father who's still alive. But you don't owe that person anything. You know, I just just know that there will be there will probably be people out there who want to martyr them because in death, you know, I, I have a joke with my stepdaughter. We talk about writing our <laughs> obituaries, but I, I say it O apostrophe bitch, B-I-T-C-H, <laughs> obituaries while we're still alive because people say the things they should say to you when you're alive. You know, people don't say the things they should say it to, about you, the nice things when you're alive. But also in an obituary, people are only saying the nice things. Unless you come across a really funny one like a McSweeney's parody, which is like, you know. <laughs> which are fun too. But yeah, you don't owe them anything. Don't censor your voice trying to write to a dead person. Yeah, Becca, I, I, I think we owe ourselves the truth and whatever our truth is in remembering those who've died and to tell it, I think, as honestly as we can, you know, with no intention to villainize, but just the truth of what it was like for us to be involved with that person, know that person, whatever that interaction was. I owe myself the truth. You know, um, a major character in my um, 
memoirs my father, whom I, you know, deeply loved. And what I feel I owe him or I hope owe any on any person that I interact with is, uh, like I said, not to demonize them and to see, see them with compassion, which doesn't mean that you kind of see them, you know, idealize them. But for me, it was important in my memoir to say that there's really no bad guys and good guys. They're all in this, you know, and I, and, you know, like if there's a saying in therapy, if you think anyone is normal, you don't know them well enough. <laughs> So I feel like I have, I come with my own baggage and my father came with his and I try to say, I think I try to tell the story as honestly as possible without a bad person and a good person. So that's what I feel I owed the people I wrote about. And I think there's great gift with us as writers. We have the opportunity to render full in full three dimension, Mm -hmm. fully three dimensionally, you know, and including ourselves, you know, the self-interrogation. I, I remember a teacher saying, convince a reader to want to read what you're, you have to render yourself as sometimes the worst person on the page. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. part of like that mm-hmm. self-interrogation. But, mm-hmm. you know, when my birth mother and my family were freaking out before the publication of this book, my editor was so great. And she's like, Megan, I would not have accepted this book if it was like some hatchet piece, you know, she's like, you rendered these characters Mm -hmm. in your life in, in three dimensions. And that's what makes this so readable. So Mm -hmm. that's what we owe them and what's life, but in three dimensions. So you're writing about a piece of, of a life. Thank you, everyone. Do you have any advice for somebody who might want to write a memoir, but is nervous about people's reactions? I think we touched on that earlier. I know my feelings are that you have to fight those feelings. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're not going to surface. I I heard the voice of Mashad in my head for five years as I was writing, and that voice was criminalizing me. Uh, So it's not as if I just erased it and wrote, but I had to fight it very often. And I think it is about staying in the ring and battling battling that voice that says, what will someone else think? What will, the, will I lose friendships? Will I lose relationships? Will they hate me? What's going to happen? I mean, all of that, you have to be willing to override all of that. If you feel your story is important and you need to tell it, then that's the primary force. I agree. And, but I think I, sometimes it helps and i think it helped me to step away for some time if it's something that's really traumatic that you're writing about to get some grounding before you write because you like you said you don't want to sort of you you know to flood your reader with like you know you all your you know like drown them in your own emotions that's not good writing about, apart from anything else but it would help I think, to get some kind of a, uh, I don't know what the word is, not objectivity, but some way in which you're able to not be embedded in the situation, which you're standing outside it and looking at it. Mm-hmm. it. It would make for a better book too, I think. I agree, yeah. Yasmin. But don't you feel that's part of the writing process? I mean, I found myself getting a lot out and then rewriting it and extracting it and rethinking it. And that was my way of examining my feelings and saying, well, maybe this is out of proportion. Maybe this is too extreme. Maybe this is, but I think you've got to give yourself the freedom to do the writing, realizing you're going to edit, you're going to rewrite, you're going to subtract, you're going to sub, you're going to insert. It's, It's like a ball of clay and you're going to keep reshaping it until it fits and it feels right. So I don't know if we can be at that perfect place when we begin I think we have to allow for a lot of mess and sloppiness and understand right. that we're not going to send it into the world in that form, but it's going to be part of, of your thinking process. Right. So I think of it in stages. There's a stage in which you're writing for yourself, basically, mm-hmm. to figure out. You know, sometimes you write to find out what the story is instead of mm-hmm. the other way around, right? And then you have the stage in which, okay, this is what I have, you know, revision to this is what the reader will see, or this is how I present this to the world. Yes, so I agree. Um, and there are any number of workshops these days, you know, writing to heal. So that's that's a process that, like Esther says, you, you go through that. Yeah. And I mean, Esther, to your point earlier, um, like the, through the lens of time, the narrative will 
will shift. It will mm-hmm. change. Um, you said you wrote the book, I think your book over the course of five years. Yasmin, I don't know how long it took. Oh, you. maybe yeah. even more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Same with me. And I think, I think there's a lot, I think that's something people don't necessarily talk about that mm-hmm. in general is how long a book really takes. And mm-hmm. mine, I put in a drawer for two, two years, maybe three, because the prospect of taking it out and going back into sort of that, that trauma was terrifying. And I was scared of it. And by the time I, I, I remember it was early, earlier pre pandemic. And I was walking around my apartment thinking, what am I afraid of? Like, I, I've always wanted to write a book. I've, and if I don't take this out and give this my best shot, like I'm going to regret this forever. And I know the, the chance of getting something published is so, is so small, but biggest thing is like, take it out and open the document, you know? And, And I also say like, from an adoptee perspective, we're, we're told to hush, you know? And I just, I just say never hush just know that your voice matters. And uh, whether like Yasmin says, if you're writing for yourself or whether you're writing for publication, your voice matters. And especially for us as women, our voice matters. This has been so wonderful. I am so thankful that you all agreed to speak. Could you each tell us where to find you and your books and if you are willing tell us what you're working on next? Sure. I you can find me at um, megangalbraith.com or on Twitter at Megan Galbraith or Instagram at m.galbraith. My next book is, uh, it's a book about adoption and it is, it is a story based on a story my birth mother told me about my great, great grandfather being a foundling at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. And it's going to take a great deal of research, but what I did find in, in my research, and because I always my journalism background always makes me want to back up the, her stories with facts or to try to see if I can track down some facts of the, of the 10,000 children that were in and out of the nursery um, that was at the 1893 world's fair. Only one was left behind and abandoned. And that one was a boy. And I think that might be my great, great grandfather. And so through the lens of, all this, these corresponding things that happened during that time. It's like the rise of spirituality, the, you know, women working outside of the home, all these things. Uh, I'm going to examine that through this book called, the working title is called The One. And so we'll also examine adoption practices and feminism and probably some witchcraft. (laughs) Sounds wonderful. Wonderful. (laughs) Well, you can find me uh, at, if you Google estheramini.com. I'm also on Instagram. As for what am I doing next, I'm working right now on a series of short stories. They're also autobiographical. You know, when you write a memoir, it has to have a narrative drive. And so there were stories that I thought were wild. And um, I really, really wanted to include in this memoir, but they didn't belong. They didn't add to the drive, to the momentum of the book. So I thought, well, now I'm going to go back and work on stories that uh, don't have to be connected uh, to the actual memoir, but are still autobiographical. And there's a lot of humor and a lot of pathos. And growing up, I felt I I was growing up at the intersection of medieval Meshad and 20th century America. And my parents were diametric opposites. Um, And the two countries and the two cultures felt like diametric opposites. So there was a lot of room for humor as well as pain. And so I am working on these short stories, and I hope it'll take me time. I write slowly, but I hope to get it all together and turn it into some kind of a collection. Thank you. So you can find me at my author page, which is staydaughter.com. And the book I'm uh, working on now, as I said earlier, has to do with adoption. It's the longing of a mother for a child and a community's refusal to accept that child as her own child. And what it means for a mother to not be able to, you know, to know that her child is not accepted in that way, more even what it means for the child. Growing up, I I knew children, in, I played with them, they were my playmates, who we all knew were nobody's own child. You know, in my adulthood, I look back and think, what was it like for them? 
to think that there was no one that they really belonged to, or at least even if their adoptive mother felt like that, the rest of the community would not allow them to feel, you know. And I hate to even use this word, but that's, you know, it's like the stain of adoption. So when they arrange marriage marriages, somebody would say, is there, is there anybody adopted in their ancestry? And if, mm -hmm. oh, well, then we can't take, you know, we, we can't, you know. Cons wow, you know, really? Really? Oh, yes. Whoa, I it's cannot so wait to talk with you more. Oh, my gosh. Like, it was like, wow. you know, it was a bit like, you know, the worst, the most common insult in the whole world. And that I speak three languages and it goes all three is for the wow. child whose parents who were not married. Right. That is the insult yeah, yeah, yeah. that everybody uses. So yeah. that's like a stain that if, if you say, you know, this this bridegroom to be, you know, the grandfather was this. Oh, no, we can't take we can't, that's just, that's, then They have to be taken out. So um, this whole idea that you can reject people like that, that they have no, you know, it's something that. You know, I, I want to explore. I don't know if I can do it justice because, and I'm so glad, Megan, maybe I can ask you. Because I, I only saw the to. pain from the outside. I didn't know what the pain, I mean, really what it was. I can imagine it, but I don't know that I have any. Oh, yes, I so I, I hope I can do justice to the topic, but I'm going to try. Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or at writingblock.com, no K. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing.